yours. All right, I think we'll, we're going to get started. Um, we've got a few people online. Um, so my name's Laura Fawcett. I'm the Clinical Trials Medical Lead um, for the Randwick Campus. Um, I'm also a PhD student of our first speaker, Dr. Shaffer Waters, and the uh, absent uh, first choice of chair, uh, Professor Adam Jaffe, um, <laughs> which I think is why I've been tapped on the shoulder to, to chair this session. Um, so I'll just start with an acknowledgement of country. Um, so I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the Aboriginal people as the traditional custodians of the lands on which our health facilities are located and the areas from which our patients are spiritually connected. We acknowledge the strength, wisdom, compassion and care Aboriginal people have for their kinship, their language, their culture and spiritual connection to country. We pay our respects to the elders, family members and children who are our future leaders. We also acknowledge our community members, our Aboriginal staff and the Aboriginal services and organisations who work closely with us to improve the health and well-being of Aboriginal children, young people, their families and communities. So I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Shaffa Waters. Uh, she is a Sciencia Senior Lecturer at UNSW and an Honorary senior, senior Scientist at Sydney Children's Hospital. After a productive PhD and postdoctoral fellowship, she secured international training fellowships in gene therapy and organoid medicine and established her independent lab in 2016. She leads an NHMRC funded research program on adult stem cell biology for cystic fibrosis that is supported by 32 grants, 21 of these are CIA, including international and national industry partnerships. Dr. Waters has developed an Australian national biobank of stem cell derived airway and gut organoids and has built a platform for high throughput therapy testing on patient organoids. She combines her unique strengths in organoid disease modeling, multiomic molecular profiling, and computational research with clinical data to improve individualized outcomes for patients with CF. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Yep. Is this okay? All right. Um, thank you so much, Laura, and thanks for the organizers for inviting me. Um, but this is not working. There we go. So today um, I will discuss tissue resident adult stem cells, and you might have heard about uh, organoids, organ on a chip models. And um, this uh, technology has been in play maybe for the last uh, five to 10 years, and now really taking on, and you would hear from it a little bit more. Uh, you might have heard about the brain organoids and the ethical implications of the brain organoids. Today I will be discussing lung, gut and other types of organoids. And um, what is special about these tissue resident adult stem cell organoids is uh, their applications and how many different applications you can actually get from these small miniaturized organ models. So not only you can do disease modeling, you can do genetic manipulation in them, but you could use them for drug screening and using them as companion diagnostic and personalized medicine, which is the focus of my talk today. And the disease that we are applying these miniaturized organ to, uh, by and large, is an inherited disease called cystic fibrosis. It's a rare disease and is a disease of the epithelial tissue where there is a single gene mutated. However, because this single gene is mutated in the epithelial tissue and because the epithelial tissue lines majority of our internal organs, then the patients who are inflicted with this disease from childhood have major symptoms with their lung, liver, gastrointestinal tract, their pancreas and their reproductive system. The main tissue and the main organs which are impacted are the lung and the GI in the current day and age with the medication that we have available. Pancreas used to be, of course, the main um, tissue impacted by, uh, by CFDR mutation. And what is important for us to know about the epithelial adult stem cells, 
Well, one is to know that all of our tissue have stem cells and that these tissue, these residing stem cells are usually in the basal membrane of the epithelium. So in our lung, these um, adult stem cells, they make up the lining of the epithelium in the lung, which means that the basal stem cell has renewal capacity, so it can make more of itself but it also can direct creation of differentiated <coughs> cell types and it will be developing many specialized cell types such as ciliated cells or the goblet cells that create mucus. The epithelium of the gut is very similar to the lung, however, although it will regenerate and has a self-renewal capacity, these LGR5 positive stem cells will differentiate into other types of cells, which yes, it includes goblet cells. They have some differences between the goblet cells of the lung and the gut, and then there are other specialized epithelial cells of the gut. And that's what we do in our lab. We actually take advantage of these stem cells. So previous to finding out how we might be able to isolate stem cells and how we might be able to culture them effectively to be able to create organoids, organ models, we used to rely as scientists on immortalized cell lines. And for cystic fibrosis research, unfortunately, that cell line was a rat thyroid epithelial cells. So you can imagine that as a model, that's not necessarily the most representative of what happens in a human body, and it definitely doesn't represent a CF child epithelium. So the advantage of um, uh, science being able to progress to the point of isolating stem cells and actually culturing them um, to recreate an, um, a, a rudimentary organ model. We are still not talking about a complex system where we've got blood vessels or immune cells in there, but it's rudimentary enough for it to be a complex epithelium. So we are no longer talking about a monolayer of cells, but rather we are talking about recreating your airway epithelium with the basal stem cells at the bottom and a pseudostratified differentiated multi-cell types, um, uh, uh, multi-cell type epithelium. So here we are looking at some wonderful imaging done by a postdoc in our lab now left, Sharon Wong, where she is showing the presence of P63 stem cells, the Mach 5 AC goblet cells, and the AC top uh, tubulated ciliated cells. And as you can see by this video, we are talking about live cell models. So you can see that the ciliated cells, they are under the movement, which is coordinated as far as cilia is concerned. Similarly, if you're looking at the human intestinal epithelial cells and human intestinal organoids, isolation of the stem cells from the crypts of the uh, tiny biopsies that we receive from the rectum of um, individuals with CF or healthy would allow us to create these miniaturized gut models. And what you're looking at over here is swelling of these gut organoids as a result of influx of water by activation of CFDR. And this uh, will be made abundantly clear to you as why activation of CFDR will cause swelling of an organoid because this is the basis of an assay that we use for understanding drug efficacy. And that's called the force following induced swelling assay. So the basis of this assay is that CFTR, which is an ion channel, which helps with the movement of chloride and bicarbonate, as a result of that movement will cause movement of water from the internal cavity of the cells to the outside. The way that the gut organoids are created, the lumen of the organoid is inside this hollow center and is filled to some extent with some mucus. 
So CFTR is pumping chloride and bicarbonate into the inside cavity of this organoid. And if CFTR is functional, this pumping, this activation will cause movement of water into the internal cavity, which you would see in these videos, which are time-lapse videos of an hour and a half as swelling of organoids. In that first video, you're looking at organoids created from a healthy individual, which means that by providing activatory compound to the CFTR, we'll be able to observe that swelling. Um, a very um, sophisticated script will measure the rate of this swelling and the speed of the swelling. However, if we apply the same assay to organoids created from our patients with cystic fibrosis, the middle panel, you're looking at organoids created from patient, let's call it patient A, and we are activating this patient's organoid with a drug which is currently on the market named or can be. And what happens with this individual organoid, as you can see, is either no movement or very small amount of movement. And what this tells us is that this specific drug is not activating this patient A CFTR channel. However, if we look at the organoids created from patient B, and what is to note here is that patient A and patient B have the same mutation in their CFTR gene. Patient B's organoid, when it's provided with the same medication, shows quite an enhanced swelling. And we know that an enhanced swelling means that the patient's organoid are responding to this drug. So this is a clear way of being able to decipher between patients who are responsive and those who are non-responsive to a medication despite the same genetic background at their CFTR locus. And the reason this is important is because in the last 10 years, there's been a large development in the field of targeted therapies for cystic fibrosis, where small molecule drugs have been identified where they can bind to the CFTR protein. And by allosteric binding to the CFTR protein, they can actually cause correction of the defects that are happening at the protein level. So we're not talking about genome editing or changing the, um, and correcting at the gene level. However, we're talking about at a protein level correction. And what that means is that depending on how the protein is mutated, we are going to need a different type of small molecule. Now, there's been, I guess, some level of categorization of the different mutations that are present in RCF population. So sometimes when you think about a monogenic disease, you would say that our life is easy, it's one gene, it's gonna be fixed really quickly, but not in the case of CFTR or CF. Although it's only one gene, there are 2,000 unique CFTR mutations, some which are pathogenic, some which are not, some which have a higher degree of pathogenesis. And I guess we all like to be able to characterize and to be able to define the different mutations into groups because that makes our life a little bit easier. And that's exactly what we've done. And one of the first classes that have been identified is simple, there is no protein being produced. And this simple no protein production is quite difficult to fix with small molecule drugs because you need to actually have a protein for your small molecules to be able to impact on. However, the other class of mutations, specifically the one, the class two mutation, where majority are of our CF patients actually have at least one allele with that type of mutation is one that has impaired boarding and trafficking. And it's um, the type of mutation that is being corrected by these small molecules rather effectively at the moment, and also the gating mutations. However, the patients are responding to these drugs quite heterogeneously. Gen <coughs> even though the mutation is the same. 
So this is just to show you that the type of the different drugs which are currently on the market, as I mentioned, we are not impacting on gene editing mRNA gene therapy, but we are in this middle layer when a protein has been developed, but it has an issue getting to the cell surface or to open up when it gets to the cell surface. And this is why our platform to create airway organoids and intestinal organoids was created. It was to be able to do disease modeling, to be able to understand some of these more rare versions uh, and rare variants of the CFTR mutation. Because it's good and well if you're a patient with a type of mutation where it's been characterized, but if you have a really rare form of CFTR mutation, you wouldn't necessarily know whether this drug is going to work for you or not. Drug companies are not necessarily interested in testing their drug when there is only one or five patients globally present with that mutation. So in 2017, we set out to create an Australian network to create CF patients um, airway organoid that was primarily created by brushing the nose. This is pre-COVID. Nobody had an aversion to getting their nose uh, brushed and um, also uh, taking bronchial lavage fluid to create uh, bronchial organoids and then possible intestinal organoids. We conducted this for patients with cystic fibrosis, individuals with asthma, and more recently we are um, uh, carrying out this work for patients with another rare lung disease, um, airway disease, PCD. <coughs> Um, the biobank at the moment is a biobank of 200, roughly 200 individuals. And with that, we have set up um, a combinational functional assay to be uh, using these organoids to be able to do drug testing. And the reason that this was possible was because of reports that was presented from our colleagues overseas to show that there is a good correlation between the efficacy of these drugs in a patient organoid and the efficacy of the response in the clinic. So to some extent, with some level of certainty, one can say if a patient organoid is responding to a drug, it is very likely that that individual will be responsive in the clinic. We do not have oversight on um, what might be any type of sensitivity to the drug and if there is going to be any side effect, but we would be able to predict the response as far as whether their CFTR is activated or not. And there's been some uh, level of um, attempt to be able to correlate that with the patient's lung function or with the improvement in their gut, in their BMI. And that's one of the works that Laura is doing at the moment. So our platform is based on three separate assays. The first one is using sync electrophysiology to assess the movement of chloride in the airway organoids of patients. The second one is by looking at the movement of fluid water as a proxy for activation of chloride channel in the gut organoids. And the third one, which is applied to variants of CFTR, which are unknown to us at the moment, is uh, in silico modeling. So this is computer-based, and it's a molecular dynamics prediction. So to give you some results and some examples of how we have applied this platform, I will give you four examples of four individuals with rare mutation. Starting with this one, an individual is, uh, with S954L mutation. And with this um, individual, we had the, um, let's say luxury of having the individual having received the medication. So we could do a direct correlation to see if the in vivo response to the medication um, as far as their weight, their FEV1, their BMI, if that actually correlated with the in vitro response that we were getting from their actual airway cells that were created into organoids and were treated with this medication that they were 
in the region. And of course, what we could see was that the airway organoids in the lab were responsive to the medication. And as we can see, this patient is showing an upward trajectory in majority of their bio markers um, as far as responding to the medication in vivo. I'll present you a second case, another rare mutation, Q1291H, who also received the same, uh, the same medication. And um, this individual was non-responsive to the medication. And what we could see in our model when we were comparing this individual's airway organoids and their response to the medication, so the green or the red, and the red is what they've actually taken in the clinic, we do not see a significant change in the chloride movement in their organoids. When we compare that to our control groups, which are patients' organoids, which we know are responsive to this medication, we can clearly see an increase in chloride movement. And if you compare that to this individual's baseline FEV1 BMI and the trajectory after, um, I believe it was a year and a half of being on, um, sorry, only three months of being on the drug, uh, you can see that there is no improvement in the clinical outcome. To make this a bit more complicated, we are moving to um, the types of mutations which we are a little bit more blind. We, these are um, pediatric individuals where we had access to both the airway and the gut. So we've done actually a lot of assays. And here we are no longer only looking at the clinically available medication because the individual wasn't actually eligible to receive anything as a result of their age and mutation. So we are looking at not not only clinically available drugs, but also combination of drugs which are not on the market at the moment. And by doing that, we would be able to advise our clinical colleagues what might be most effective for this individual should those drugs be available um, and on the market. Um, with this study, we also established that we do not actually require to have both the lung and the gut model to be doing the testing on. We could use either the lung or the gut cells. In, in effect, we could use any epithelial tissue type to be able to do our assays on and decipher and predict outcome. Which meant that for our next um, uh, child with CF with another rare mutation, I37R, where we only had gut organoids, we still managed to uh, have an understanding of what was the impact of this really rare mutation. We believe that he's one of two in the world with this mutation and what type of drug might be most effective. Carrying out molecular dynamics give our studies a different edge. We are no longer just talking about clinical impact, but we are looking at adding to the value and the body of knowledge by actually understanding and deciphering the molecular dynamics of CFTR. So what's next is um, looking at a whole lot more mutations and the lab is in, um, in the process of looking at a number of different rare mutations to be able to understand what drug may or may not work. But hot off the press and where we are going next is actually trying to identify a way to help those individuals which have no protein being produced. And this cannot be done at the moment with small drug molecules. So what we have decided might be the next phase is to actually do stem cell therapies. And stem cell therapies is not new. You can take the stem cell out of the patient, you can manipulate them, you can do genome editing and then expand those cells and put those cells back in. The cells don't have to be patient own cells, although we've decided that that would be the best option to go forward and autologous stem cell therapy, because it means that the likelihood of rejection is lower. 
And that's exactly what we've been doing in the lab. We have been collecting cells, we have done the genome editing, and we have been measuring how much correction are we getting as a result of our genome editing. We cannot so far genome edit 100% of the cells, so we are still having a population of cells which are not corrected. However, what we can see is that if we actually combine the small molecules and the genome editing, we will end up with a higher level of CFTR production. And this is quite useful because then we are still using these small molecules which are available in the clinic, but we also have another avenue. So to take this forward, we had proposed that we would be able to put these cells in the first instance in the sinus cavity. To be able to do this in human, we first have to go into an animal model. Rodents are non-useful in this situation. They don't have a, a sinus. So we've had to work with rabbits. And this is hot off the press as of this morning with our collaborators at UAB. And what they've been doing is they have been putting these corrected stem cells and they've been putting them on a um, gel substance and grafting that gel in the sputum of the rabbit. And when you look at 28 days after allograft of these stem cells, if you look at the control rabbit where no stem cells were grafted, you can see this is scarring between the sputum and the turbinate. However, when you're looking at the experimental rabbit, when the stem cells were grafted, that scarring is not there. There's been some measurements for ever surface liquid depth, the liquid layer and the mucus transport. And in all of these cases, there is an improvement. And we, this is really preliminary work. We are talking about N equal one rabbit at the moment, but it's given us enough hope to be able to then progress this forward. So this is our platform to, and we have been funded by um, an MRFF to be able to take our platform and actually have an organoid guided uh, clinical trial, which means that there is um, roughly, apologies, I don't remember the number, I think 20 individuals who will be enrolled in this trial. Uh, to be enrolled, they have to have really a rare variant of CF. They need to provide their lung or gut organoid, and we we will do the testing with our collaborators at the University of Newcastle in Australia. And then we would be able to suggest whether that individual organoid is responsive or non-responsive. And as a result of that test, they would be enrolled in this clinical trial. So with that in mind, and um, I did mention that my acknowledgement slide had been deleted because I put in these videos at the last minute. So I'd like to, uh, to thank my team, they're present here. And I would like to thank all of my collaborators and colleagues and our funding buddies. Thank you so much. Sorry. What a, what a lovely body of work. Question I had was actually about um, automating your organoid model for um, swelling for diagnostics. It looks like you're using a microscope platform. Are there ways to make that easier to actually do? I mean, I'm thinking you know, we use a lot of flow cytometry in haematology and stuff like that. It's very easy to automate and get sort of relatively quantitative results. I was just wondering what your thoughts are about improving the diagnostic platform side of your personalised medicine for cystic yeah. fibrosis. Uh, thank you for that curly question. Yeah. Um, um, so, look, I guess my, my initial hope um, was that we would be able to actually implement it as a microscopy live imaging uh, platform. Um, our colleagues in Netherlands have managed to go towards a high throughput system. So we are on a 96 well plate and they've moved to the 368 with an automated robotic arm that moves things. So um, 
perhaps at this point, maybe changing the assay may not necessarily be the, the way forward, but rather optimizing the way that we are doing this assay. So it's no longer in the technical hands of individuals, but more on a robotic arm. There are other assays with halide measurements and flow cytometry. It's just that none of them have had the reproducibility of what we are getting from this specific system. So as much as, um, and I do acknowledge that it's not necessarily the easiest or the most, um, I guess, known way of doing the diagnostic testing, I think it might just be the one that we try and implement. Awesome, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the opportunity to chat to you today about my work. So it's about utilizing the patient-derived <coughs> models to identify effective biomarker-driven therapies for children with cancer. Uh, I had exactly the same last time. I'm not sure what I do wrong. The arrows are not working. No, I had exactly the same last week. Ah, awesome. awesome. It takes just time. I'm not sure um, whether or not you are all aware, aware of the Zero National uh, Trial that's in, in Australia. But basically, uh, the idea of this trial is to identify personalized treatments for all children with cancer. So what happens is if a patient with cancer comes to the hospital, the tumor biopsies are collected. And the first thing that happens is that we perform molecular profiling of the tumors to identify basically gene alterations for which drugs are available that can be given to the patients. So what is done is methylation profiling, RNA sequencing, and whole genome sequencing. However, um, we have now found out, let's say that molecular profiling alone is not sufficient to identify uh, therapies for all children with cancer because a recent publication has shown that only for 70% of the patients we can identify a potential hit, basically for which drugs are available that can be given, meaning that for the other 30% of the patients, we need to come up with additional other strategies, right, to identify uh, treatment options. Another complexity that we are really encountering uh, in the clinical setting is that the association between gene alteration found in a cancer and sensitivity to a drug targeting this gene alteration is not often that simple. So that's why within the Zero Childhood Cancer Program, we also develop in vitro and in vivo model systems using the same patient material that we use for molecular profiling basically to perform drug testing, to identify effective drugs, independent of the gene alterations that are found in this specific tumor. Um, so then all information together basically is collected for individual patients and then discussed in the so-called multidisciplinary tumor board. And then based on these results, clinicians uh, yeah, are making a decision on what to do next with the patients if the current therapies are not working. So as said, uh, our team is leading the in vitro high throughput drug testing within the Zero Childhood Cancer Program, and that's what I would like to focus on today. So I would shortly like to address like, okay, how is this done in the Zero Childhood Cancer Program? How do we do in vitro drug testing using the patient's tumor cells? 
how can we exploit the data that we generate within the Zero to Child Cancer Program to better understand the associations between gene alterations and sensitivity to a specific drug? How can we uh, work on, let's say, uh, drug combination testing? So how can we utilize the data to identify potential combinations? And can we indeed also test combinations in the standard setting? And then also a little bit tell about changes that have been recently made and yeah, plans that we have to further improve this whole platform. So first, the in vitro drug testing within the Zero Childhood Cancer Program. How does this work? Well, when we, when we receive tumor biopsies, what we do is we dissociate the tumor cells, we plate them, and that's what we would like to use for high throughput drug testing. However, you can imagine that not in all cases we yeah, receive sufficient material, right, to screen multiple uh, drugs. So what happens in these cases is that before we do any drug testing, we need to expand the tumor cells, and this can be done in different ways. So for certain cancers, we expand the tumor cells in vitro, in the dish, uh, but in other cases, we need to expand the tumor cells in mice. So important, of course, is if you use uh, high throughput drug testing to guide clinical treatment decision making, you need to ensure that the cells that you use for drug testing are still recapitulating, right, the patient characteristics. So all samples that we use for high throughput drug testing are characterized and validated using different technologies. So for all cases, we perform SNP array profiling to really confirm that the copy number profile of the cells that we screen is similar to the copy number profile of the original tumor. But we also use, for example, immunohistochemistry, where we look really at tumor-specific markers, but also at the, uh, let's say, cell proliferation markers, such as key 67, to see if the proliferation rate of your cells in the dish during drug testing is comparable with what is happening in the original patient, because this might all influence drug responses. So how is the drug screening itself uh, uh, done at this stage? So we have a library basically containing 126 drugs. And these are all drugs that are clinically used for pediatric cancer treatment or are in clinical development or far preclinical development for pediatric cancer. So these drugs are thrown on the, on the cells and then for three days, and then we read out the cell viability using cell type and glow assays. And then we, let's say, because we test increasing concentration ranges, so from 0.5 nanomolar, still five micromolar, then we generate the dose response curves for each drug. Uh, shown here, and then we calculate the so-called area under the curve values, as well as the IC50 values, which is made basically the half maximal inhibitory concentration of about the lower, the more effective your drug. So what do we call sensitive, right, for an individual patient? Well, to give an example, for each drug, basically, that we test, we compare the sensitivity that we observe for an individual patient with the sensitivity of the same drug in a whole bunch of reference patients, basically. So all the other patients that we have screened in the past. So to give you an example here, so there is this multi-targeted uh, kinase inhibitor named Tadanib has been tested in multiple samples. So each dot is an individual sample. And then we look at the log to IC50 values, the AUC values, the lower, the more sensitive. So here, the red dot is, for example, in this case, a specific uh, a sarcoma sample. And then we compare the sensitivity basically with the sensitivity we observe for all the other samples. And then when the Z score for both the AUC and the log to IC50 values is below minus two, we say, aha, this patient is really sensitive when we compare it with all other cases. So that's interesting. And that's what we call a hit. So if you look what we have screened uh, so far, we performed successful drug testing for over 170 zero samples. So covering all uh, main types of pediatric cancers and multiple subtypes. Uh, and as you can see on this side is that, yes, we are often uh, uh, able to perform drug testing in freshly dissociated tumor cells, but we also frequently need to expand the tumor cells. So for the brain tumors, you see that we primarily expand the cells in vitro, but for example, for the sarcomas and the neuroblastomas, we primarily expand the tumor cells in vivo when we don't have sufficient material. Importantly is, of course, like if you want to guide treatment decision making based on the in vitro high throughput drug testing results, you need to be in time, right? You need to generate the data in a relevant time frame. So we looked at how long it takes approximately to report back results for high throughput drug testing when expanding the materials. 
So here you see the expansion times for the in vitro expanded samples and here for the in vivo expanded samples. And on average, it takes approximately three months when we expand the cells to report back. And this means in the practice that for 82% of the cases where we expand the tumor material, we are in time with reporting back the results, at least meaning that the patient is still under clinical care at the moment that we are able to report our drug hits. Of course, another important question is like, yes, if we do, let's say, drug testing on freshly dissociated cells for one patient or for another patient, we expand the cells in vitro and then we do in vivo, does this influence your drug responses, right? So yes, we look at the copy number profile, this is still similar, but we don't dive exactly in the RNA profiling landscapes and the mutation status yet. So to have a look and dive uh, a little bit into this is what we did for, so all drugs, all 126 drugs, we classified them in different uh, classes of agents. So for example, drugs that uh, target proteins in the Rasmus kinase signaling pathway or in the purity kinase signaling pathway. And then we calculated the median area under the curve set scores. So the more, again, the lower, the more sensitive in general. Um, and then look like, okay, for each sample, how do they cluster together based on this median area under the curve set score? So how are the dose response profiles influencing the, 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 the sample clustering? So here you see each, each column is an individual patient. Here, the color indicates basically different tumor types. And then below you see the type of sample that has been used for drug testing. So orange means freshly, freshly dissociated samples, gray means expanded samples. And as you can appreciate, the clustering is not occurring. It's like not all orange cases cluster together, right? So it's not that all freshly dissociated screens cluster together and show the same sensitivity patterns to all drugs and the expanded cluster completely differently. And this indicates nicely that it's more the molecular driven, uh, it's molecular driven basically the observations that we observe rather than uh, model dependent. And another indication is, let's say we had one case for a sarcoma patient where we, uh, where we were able to do uh, high throughput drug testing, both on freshly dissociated samples and uh, in vivo expanded samples. So that's shown here. So here you see the correlation of all the drugs when we look at the area under the curve values and the log to IC50 values for freshly dissociated versus in vivo expanded cells for the same patient. And you can clearly see that it very nicely correlates as a second indication that expansion does not influence the drug responses. Then of course, <laughs> it's important to prove that, let's say performing high throughput drug testing does pick up the known associations between gene alterations and drug sensitivity. So to prove that your system is working. So, and to do this, we really took, let's say the well-known example. So we know that brain cancer patients with an NTRAC fusion should respond to treatment with NTRAC inhibitors, such as labotrectinib. We also know that when patients have a BRAF V600E mutation, this is a very good biomarker for response to BRAF inhibitors, such as dabravenib and vemuravenib. So what we did is we looked at what did we observe in our cohort and do we have matching clinical data? So for example, here again, each dot is an individual patient. Here, the efficacy of lar larotrectinib across the whole cohort that we screened. And you can clearly see there is one sample standing out that has a way lower area in the curve value compared to all other cases. And this was indeed the only case with an NTRAC fusion in our cohort being the most sensitive. And this correlated nicely with the clinical treatment. Uh, so the patient received larotrectinib and we did see tumor regression. And the same was true for the BRAF uh, inhibitors in our library. So there were two samples really being more sensitive to both BRAF inhibitors compared to all other cases. And this nicely correlated with the observed tumor regression in the patients as well. And also, we also looked at, let's say, tumor type dependent um, efficacy patterns. So we know, for example, that BCL2 inhibition is very effective in general in hematologic malignancies when we compare it to uh, solid cancer types. And that's indeed when, uh, uh, something that we picked up. So these are all volcano plots where we really compared sensitivity of the drugs in this case for brain cancers compared to the other tumor types or for hematological cancers compared to the other cancer types. And then you see indeed for the hematological malignancies that for natoclax was relatively effective compared to the solid cancers. However, as said, it's not always that easy, right? These are the nice examples and they show that the system in generally is working. 
So now the question is, how can we use this to better understand the responses in the other cases? And to give you an example of this, so what currently happens is, of course, there are multiple precision medicine programs run across the world, and we all find the same, let's say, uh, mutations and copy number variations for which drugs are available that are frequently occurring in pediatric cancers. And among them are, for example, uh, alterations in genes in, uh, that are important in cell cycle regulation. So we often see CDKN2A B loss or CDK4 amplification, RB1 loss when we look at cell cycle regulation, but also, for example, P10 loss or PIK3CA mutations that are associated with active PRT kinase signaling. So what happens is then, if we observe this in the clinical setting, often we think we should treat these patients with, well, in the case of cell cycle alterations with CDK4-6 inhibitors that have been approved for clinical use, or in case of the PRT kinase alterations with mtop one inhibitors that have been approved. However, when we look back now at the results observed so far, when we look at the clinical use of these inhibitors in these cases, results are a little bit disappointing, right? And that's also what we observe when we look back now at all the data we have collected on the patient materials, we see the same happening. So here you see the area under the curve set score for all CDK4-6 uh, inhibitors that we tested on all samples. So we had three of them. Each dot again is an individual patient, the lower the sensitive. So here we basically gave a color to all samples uh, that do harbor an alteration in cell cycle signaling that is normally used as an indicator for treatment with CDK4-6 inhibitor. And all the gray dots are the ones without any alteration. And as you can see, all the colored dots are, let's say, spread all over the place, right? Even when without looking carefully, you can see some are resistant, some are sensitive. So it, it tells us a little bit like having these alterations is not always indicative for sensitivity to CDK4-6 inhibition. And the same is observed when we look at the PRT kinase pathway inhibitors that we have tested. So besides mTOP1 inhibitors that are currently clinically used, also the other investigational drugs, such as dual mTOP1-2 inhibitors or the AKT inhibitors. If we look again at the color dots that do have, which are the samples that do harbor alterations in the PRT kinase signaling pathway, you again see all spread all over the place. So I want to highlight just a kind of example of the value of the in vitro high throughput drug testing by looking at the mTOR1 inhibitors that are clinically used. So we have three of them that we tested in, uh, on all cases. So among them was one sample which was insensitive. It was an osteosarcoma sample that harbored a TSC2 uh, inactivating mutation, which is normally associated uh, with active PRT kinase signaling. And we had an um, um, Ewing sarcoma patient with an activating mutation in PIK3CA. And then you see the osteosarcoma patient, we found, yeah, little efficacy. You can see here, this is the cell viability, almost nothing is happening. So 100% is the maximum. You only have slight uh, uh, efficacy. Well, with the PIK3CA mutation, you see clearly um, sensitivity to the M to our, uh, inhibitors, and now I just pulled out one of the inhibitors, but it's the same for all of them. <coughs> so then, how does this relate to clinical and in vivo data? So for the same samples, we also have in vivo efficacy data available. So we tested Tamsarolimus in uh, the mouse models, having the same cells injected and grafted, basically. We waited till they developed tumors and then they received Tamsarolimus treatment. And you can really see that Tamsarolimus was indeed more effective uh, effective in the PIK3CA mutated human sarcoma case compared with the osteosarcoma case, which is correlating with our observations in vitro. And the same was observed in the clinical, when we looked at the clinical efficacy of tensorolimus, which was added to the standard chemotherapy treatment for both patients. We did see a partial response for the human sarcoma uh, patient and progressive disease for the osteosarcoma. So this shows that in certain cases, in vitro drug testing might really be helpful, right, to guide clinical treatment decision making. So, yeah, to better understand, like, let's say, to, to find novel predictive biomarkers of drug response, let's say it that way, we are now working on really integrating all the molecular profiling data that we generated as part of the Zero Childhood Cancer Program with the available in vitro drug response profiling data that we have generated so far. And to give you an example how this can help us, 
I want to highlight basically two examples. Uh, one is sensitivity to B1 inhibition. So here you can see we tested the B1 inhibitor adivocetib again on multiple samples. And you can see really differential sensitivity again across the cohort. And that's what you need, right? If you want to find something new, you need to have responders and non-responders, otherwise you can't find anything new. So what we did is we first uh, used RNA expression data basically, and then performed gene set enrichment analysis, where we calculated the Pearson error correlations between the area under the curve set scores of adivocity and the log transform gene expression uh, values, and then to basically study which biological processes can be linked to sensitivity to B1 inhibition. So when we did this, not surprisingly, the, the top um, yeah, enriched gene sets that popped up were G2M checkpoint and replication basically. And that makes sense because we one is playing a very important role in G2M DNA damage checkpoint. But what we also picked up is let's say a link enrichment of gene sets indicating that, MIG, uh, that the MIG family of oncogenes might be important as well in determining sensitivity to adivocetib, yes or no. And then we know that MCN, for example, is a very important oncogene in neuroblastoma, as that is my background. That is something we, of course, uh, were diving into. And then we did indeed observe that when we took the MCN amplified neuroblastoma cases in our cohort and compared them with the MCN wild type cases, we did see lower area under the curve values and log to IC50 values for the mutated and uh, the MCN amplified uh, cases. So the next thing what we did is to really prove the, let's say, dependency of the, the importance of MCN in sensitivity to V1 is we had this neuroblastoma cell line where we can turn off uh, MCN. So that's what we did. So we have this cell line. If we turn off MCN, that's what you see here. Then we saw that indeed the sensitivity to adiposity decreased, basically. So really confirming that MCN might be a potential predictive biomark of neuroblastoma sensitivity to B1 inhibition. The second example uh, is sensitivity to MAC inhibition. So MAC inhibitors are frequently used for pediatric cancer treatment. And we know that the RASMAT kinase pathway is playing an important role in multiple pediatric cancer types. So of course, uh, we tested multiple of these inhibitors. So when we take one of them, so called tramatinib, and we compare the sensitivity in Rasmat kinase altered cases versus normal Rasmat kinase samples, then you do see indeed that on average, your tramatinib is doing better in samples that harbor alterations in these pathways. But there are exceptions, right? So we have cases that are resistant. So you have these alterations, but they still don't respond. But we also very nicely see the subgroup they don't harbor any alteration in this pathway, but still they are very sensitive. They are as sensitive, basically, as the sensitive cases that are clinically used to guide treatment with MAC inhibition. So these cases, when we dove a little bit more into it, concern mainly brain uh, cancers, so DMGs and high-grade gliomas, and film tumor uh, samples. So what we did is, um, let's say, luckily in the beginning when we were <laughs> aiming to grow the brain tumor samples, we were not uh, successful in all cases because that gave us the opportunity to basically generate an efficacy data set in normal uh, uh, cells, so derived from the brain that were not the cancer cells. So what we did is we used these non-cancerous samples to compare the efficacy of tramatinib <coughs> in the high-grade gliomas and the DMG samples in our cohort with the non-cancerous uh, samples. And then you can clearly see both based on the AUC values and the log to IC50 values that tramatinib is way more effective indeed in the cancer cells compared to the non-cancerous cells. The question is of course, why? Why are these so sensitive, right? So we, uh, we looked at the, the genomic characteristics of these samples and what we did observe is that three of, out of the five most sensitive cases did harbor an uh, activating mutation in pic 3 one which is playing an important role in activation of the PUT kinase signaling pathway, for which we know it interacts with the Rasmat kinase signaling pathway. And these samples had, uh, besides these mutations, also other alterations in the same pathway. So what we did is uh, we took two of the sensitive DMG cases that do harbor a pic 3 one mutation in the presence of other PUT kinase pathway alterations. And then we first of course looked at the, the uh, purity kinase signaling pathway activity and compared this basically with a controlled DMG sample 
without any alteration in this pathway to see differences in sensitivity uh, in, in purity kinase pathway uh, activation. And what we did observe, so you have to look at the minus uh, columns, meaning no treatment has been given. So you do see that the DMG samples with pig 3 one mutations do have activated purity kinase signaling. So P phospho AKT is high, higher than the DMG case without alteration. Um, and the next thing that we did is like, okay, if it is sensitive to terminating, the Rasmap kinase signaling pathway should somehow be activated, right? So we also looked at activated Rasmap kinase signaling by detecting phospho ERK le levels. And we compared this with a positive control. So in high grade, we know that high grade gliomas that do have BRAP V600 mutations, that's activating for the Rasmap kinase signaling pathway as well. So we took that along as a control. And you see here, phospho ERK is high indeed in the BRAF mutated high-grade glioma, which you can see phospho ERK levels are also high in the DMG cases with activating pig 3 one mutations and not in the DMG case uh, without pig 3 one mutation. So this is quite um, uh, interesting. And this was actually in line with an observation that they did in an uh, other country, I think it was Germany, where they tried to grow a brain tumor sample that had a pig 3 one mutation in different ways, so 2D and 3D. And when they grew the sample in 2D, they observed basically that the pig 3 one mutation, uh, they got rid of the population harboring this mutation, and it was retained in the 3D setting. And then they observed sensitivity of tramatinib in the case where the pig 3 one mutation was still present, but not in when they lost the pig 3 one mutated population. So what we are currently working on is, let's say, yeah, validating whether or not pig 3 one mutations can indeed be used as a predictive biomarker for brain tumor samples, sensitivity to MAC inhibition. And also the question that we do have is, does this provide maybe rational to combine MAC inhibition and purity kinase pathway inhibition for these cases? Then of course, uh, uh, the next topic, <laughs> which is very important, which is drug combination testing. We all know that the treatment of pediatric cancer patients with a single targeted agent is not gonna work. So we need to be smarter, uh, even when we don't <laughs> understand yet all single agent drug responses, we need to go to the next level uh, by combining drugs. So how do we use now the drug uh, efficacy data that is currently available? Well, one of the things that we did is we basically correlated drug response profiles of all the drugs across the whole cohort to see if sensitivity to, to drugs might help us guiding sensitivity to the combination. And that's basically what is shown in this complex uh, uh, figure. So basically, these are the Pearson R values of the drug responses across the cohort. Red means basically that two drugs are behaving quite similar. So they are sensitive in the same samples and insensitive in the same other samples. And when it's blue, it means they are, let's say, mutual exclusive. They respond completely different. Well. As anticipated, of course, drugs with a similar mechanism of action nicely clustered together in most cases. To give you an example, the CDK4-6 inhibitors nicely behave similar. Same holds true for the mtok one inhibitors. So when mtok one inhibitor A is effective, B is also effective. However, more interesting is, of course, how do the correlations between drugs with different mechanisms of actions look like? And then we, for example, saw very high correlations between drugs that uh, are targeting uh, DNA topo acid race um, and uh, targeted agents in the DNA damage checkpoint. And as a more specific example that's shown here, for example, here you see the correlation of sensitivity to Aurora kinase A inhibitor alicetate and uh, the arenotecan metabolite SN38. So you can see that the area and curve values in most cases nicely correlate. So we have, we, I here highlight three cases in orange that clearly show sensitivity to both of these inhibitors. So we use this to test alicetib, basically in combination with chemotherapy in, uh, in in vivo models for the, using the same patient material. And then you can see that in all cases, the combination worked way better than single agent treatment with alicetib or uh, chemotherapy containing arenotecan. Another thing that we now recently implemented is standard combination testing. So what we do is we combine two drugs and that we test those in a matrix design. So multiple concentrations drug A, multiple concentrations drug B. Uh, and among the combinations that we implement are not only combinations that can be given clinically directly, because that's what we want to do as well, but also think about the future, right? So we want to come up with novel combinations and to guide future clinical trials. 
Um, so one of the combinations that we are currently testing, just to give you an example, is combined uh, inhibition of MEC and PANRAF, both in the same pathway, really with the idea to, to support a future optimized trial arm. Um, so we have tested this combination now on over 40 zero samples. And if we look into this data, then uh, yeah, it looks quite interesting. So we do see strong synergies. And for example, in sarcoma samples with NF1 loss, and NF1 is loss is a marker of activated plasma kinase signaling. So here you see the dose response curves. The blue line is basically single agent tramatinib. And all the other lines are with increasing concentrations of the PAMRAF inhibitor. And you can see here is the PAMRAF inhibitor alone. Not, and you can see that, like, yeah, you give an increasing dose of the PAMRAF inhibitor, nothing is happening. But somehow here the curves start to diverge a lot. And that tells us really there is synergism occurring. However, again, you know, we also have some cases, we do see very strong synergism, but we don't know yet why. And for example, if you look at the brain cancer samples again, we often have a, a strong synergism. Uh, here is a, a nice example. But these patients, again, don't harbor any alteration that are in the RASMAP kinase signaling pathway. They don't have the pic 3 one mutation I was talking about earlier. But we do see strong synergism. And instead, in many cases, we do see, let's say, amplification or strong overexpression of receptor tyrosine kinases on the surface of the cancer cell. And this is basically also indicative or might be involved in activation of both the PDT kinase pathway and the RASMAP kinase signaling pathway. So what we are doing uh, currently is we are exploring this further because if we want to, yeah, uh, let's say, make the clinical trial work most efficiently, we need to understand these kind of observations. So what we're trying to find out in the lab is really like, what's the mechanism behind the synergism that we observe in the N1 deleted sarcoma cases? What is that kind of feedback loop uh, that explains what our observations? Other question we have is what's the role of these receptor tyrosine kinases? Is this indeed causing these, this activation and explaining this synergism? And what are other predictive biomarkers that we can use when we open the optimized basket trial arm? So what's uh, next? Uh, so recently we actually uh, switched to a novel improved library where we uh, now have a completely new library containing 150 drugs covering a broader range of targets that are important in pediatric cancer. And just uh, as an indication for the first uh, sample, so we have screened now, I think approximately 45 cases, and you see very nice differential sensitivity patterns for many novel drugs. Very interesting because that enables us again to find novel biomarkers for interesting drugs to improve the clinical success of implementation. And also what we now changed is the implementation of tailored concentration ranges. So what we did previously is we used the same concentration range for all drugs, but we all know that some drugs are very effective in the nanomolar range, while in other cases we need to be in the micromolar range. So we searched in literature uh, to really look like what are the achievable plasma concentrations that we can get in children. Um, and if that data is not available then in adults to at least have an indication and to show you how important this is. So as I said, with the old library, we screened up to five micromolar. But for example, pasopanib, which is uh, used, um, it gave us this pattern with the old library. So if you look at all samples, in many cases, we didn't see any efficacy. We didn't find any IC50 value, basically. So we scored this. All these cases were reported as being like insensitive to this drug. However, we know that in the clinical setting, we can achieve way higher concentrations. So are these really no responders? Well, that's why now on the new library, we test a completely different range. So we go up to 200 micromolar for this drug. And now you can see, uh, again, we have some really <coughs> insensitive cases. But now you see here, uh, again, we are now picking up some differential sensitivities. And for example, the is a neuroblastoma case and a medulloblastoma case that have IC50 values that are basically higher than the IC50 values than the five micromolar we were used to test previously. And in this case, they are reported as a hit. Well, previously, this was not the case. So it really makes a difference tailoring the concentration ranges for each drug. Another thing that's now ongoing, so this platform, I think, yes, I show you now some very nice results. 
But again, of course, it has some limitations, uh, important limitations. And one of them is we are not taking into account the extra cell, yeah, the, 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 the tumor microenvironment, basically the extra cellular matrix. So that makes this platform currently not useful for, for example, immunotherapy drugs or epigenetic agents. So we are now collaborating with different research groups and we are open-minded to collaborate with all of you if you have nice ideas here as well to really take this into account. So we are working with the bioprinting team at the Children's Cancer Institute Institute to really bioprint freshly dissociated tumor samples and also with uh, the UTS and um, the epigenetic teams of the Children's Cancer Institute to use a novel technology which is called Alton where you basically use tumor pieces that you let's say put in a hydrogel so you retain the, the complete environment and use the explorer that as a useful technology to uh, test immunotherapy and epigenetic drug testing. So that brings me actually to the end. And I hope that I have shown to you uh, basically that, yeah, performing in vitro drug testing on patient-derived models really, let's say, increases the therapeutic options available to children with high-risk cancers. It helps us in better understanding the, the associations between uh, yeah, genetic characteristics of the tumors and uh, targeted agents. And also, yeah, it's very useful to help us in identifying effective combinations, which is really important because we can't test all possible combinations. We have limited material, limited, luckily, uh, not as many uh, pediatric cancer patients compared to the adults. So we are restricted in our options. Um, so yeah, that brings me to uh, thanking everyone involved, which is actually a huge number of uh, persons. Uh, and also all the funding uh, agencies and the international collaborations. So thank you. Thank you, I mean, it's fantastic talks. If there are any questions online, I, and I'm gonna limit it to one, if there's one in the room, we're a bit over time. No. Off the hook, we're five minutes over. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank both speakers. Um, and I don't know if there's another session coming up in a, in a couple of months' time in October. October the 12th. So, a focus on childhood dementia and dementia in older adults in October. Thank you very much.